Hello everyone, and today we're going to be celebrating my channel reaching 150 subscribers with a video most of you would suspect. It is a video on the Dwarfs of Warhammer. Just a basic overview, but a good reference for any of you who want to roleplay as a dwarf in the setting and the like, you know. Before we begin, I just want to thank everyone who likes and comments on my videos, and I also want to thank patrons and those who listen to my podcast. If you want to support me on my Patreon, then uh, there'll be a link in the description below. But I never want to pressure anybody into that. Just saying, you guys make the world go round. Alright, so let's begin. Warhammer Dwarfs are grim and dour. Even upbeat and fun-loving members of their race grow solemn when speaking of old grudges, lost glories, and their ancestors. Even compared to the other peoples in this grimdark setting, the dwarfs have the shit end of the stick, a lot of the time. Much of their ancient empire is lost, and they are in a constant struggle against innumerable foes. They battle enemies that others don't even know of, or believe don't exist, such as the Skaven. Under attack, dealing with earthquakes and volcanic activity, betrayed by the elves of old, and now attempting to keep a fallen empire from collapsing completely, any other people would have died long ago. But the dwarfs are stalwart in their resolve and unshakable in their stubborn courage. There are three kinds of dwarfs. Well, let's say two and a half. There are the dwarfs we are going to discuss, meaning the dwarfs of the World's Edge Mountains. The next, more dreadful type, are the Chaos Dwarfs who live in the Badlands. They're an interesting bunch with a cool as fuck backstory, but we'll get to them at some point. Not much in this video, but later. The third, or half, faction of dwarfs are the Norse Dwarfs, who are technically a part of the World's Edge Mountain Dwarfs, only slightly separated thanks to being in places like Norska and above Kislev. But in all essence, they are a part of the civilization of their southern cousins as well. They're just a few hundred years being separated, and they only really differ slightly in architecture and armor, and their main oddity is their accents. Most dwarfs have North English Sheffield accents. Think Sean Bean in Game of Thrones. Whereas the Norse dwarfs have heavy, heavy Scottish accents, like Warcraft dwarfs. It's an odd thing to most other dwarfs, and downright incomprehensible to most men of the Empire. Other than that, though, they're pretty much the same, so we'll keep them in the same category. And there are also the dwarfs called the Grey Dwarfs because they live in the Grey Mountains, which is between Bretonia and Kislev. I'm sorry, Bretonia and the Empire, but at the same time, like I said, it's a part of the World's Edge Mountains, so we'll keep them in the same category, too. So, if you've ever read or seen the Lord of the Rings series, or read any fantasy book series, you might think you know all there is to know about dwarfs, even if you're not familiar with this universe. Beards, they dig, they drink a lot, etc. Well, there's a lot more to it than that, so sit down and shut up. Now, let's go and talk about the basics of dwarves and dwarf culture. We'll start with their biological and physical appearances and attributes. A dwarf, contrary to popular belief, is short, not small. Meaning, they are squat and short, but when you count total mass, they are the same size as a man, and maybe even bigger in many cases. Dwarf bodies are tough, with thick skin and bones. They have physiques that give them powerful muscles, and yet there is something about them that makes them even stronger than they look. A human with the same dimensions and weight and height as a dwarf would somehow be weaker. While they might not have what you call supernatural strength or be nigh invulnerable to harm, it's clear they were almost purpose-built for labor and warfare. Their fingers are far more dexterous than you might think as well. The main physical failing of dwarfs is their short, stubby legs that make them very slow when attempting to sprint. By contrast, though, they're very adept rock climbers. They have a preternatural ability to see cracks and imperfections in stone and instinctively know where to put their fingers and feet to ascend safely. Dwarfs, as you might have guessed, are very adept at seeing in the dark as well. They also have keen senses of smell and can smell if a stone is freshly cut or not, for instance. Now let's get to lifespans. Games Workshop is notably vague when it comes to stating how long different races can live. For instance, they say something along the lines of, Dragons are very old, and elves can live for centuries if not millennia, and so forth. However, based on my research of novel reading and checking certain dates and anecdotes we have been given, I have the probably the most accurate ages we can surmise for the dwarfs. Usually, beardlings are dwarfs either below 100 years old or, or they're 50 years old or above. 
um, or, or 50 years old or below, I mean. Many dwarfs consider themselves seasoned after about 120 years, and they usually become fabled long beards around 170 all the way up to even 250 years old, meaning their beards touch the floor when they stand at their full height. So yes, they would have thick, four-foot beards. Usually around 70% of the dwarf population live to be around 250 to 300 years old. However, there are exceptions. A sizable dwarf population can live another century or two, becoming much more rare great beards, and some rare few can live longer than that. There are dwarves who are literally, and I mean literally, too stubborn to die. They are called living ancestors, and there have been a few who have reached a thousand years old. They're special in more than their age, but in religious significance as well. It would be hard to explain without giving a few more facts on dwarf biology, so I'll get into that first. Dwarfs are special when it comes to the warm-blooded races, as they don't grow older like men or even elves. A dwarf actually ages like a reptile, meaning that as they grow older, they don't grow more frail. They never stop growing bigger, stronger, and tougher. Long beards are not only feared because they are experienced and wise, but because their skin is as tough as leather, and they have arms that can toss anvils great distances. No one knows why or how, but usually a dwarf reaches a breaking point in their lives, where they halt growing stronger and grow frail very rapidly, dying a few short years after they reach the breaking point, usually around the 250th to 300th year or so. A great beard that lives longer is lucky and staves the breaking point off further until probably their 400th birthday. However, a living ancestor has no breaking point, or none that we know of, and it's seen as a blessing from the dwarf gods that they don't get one. Many dwarfs who live longer than others usually do so because they still have a grudge to settle or vengeance to wreak. Like uh, King Gotrek Starbreaker, who ruled the Dwarf Empire during the War of Vengeance when they fought the High Elves, lived to be 655 years old, as he did not ha allow himself to grow old and die as he had the war to see through. The oldest known dwarf is named Crag the Grim, the most powerful runesmith alive. A runesmith being a dwarf that can craft magical effects through runes. He is 1620 years old. As you probably heard from my video on the War of Vengeance, dwarfs are also very resistant to both disease and chaos corruption. Dwarfs never worry about plagues, and it takes a very large exposure to chaos taint or warp stone to have any effect on their bodies or psyche. In the case of the chaos dwarves, they were trapped above ground in the middle of the desert as rampant chaos magic flowed over them for months, if not years, whereas a human would have begun to turn into mutated spawn of chaos in mere hours or days if they were particularly tough. Now let us move on to dwarf culture. Dwarf society is patriarchal, though it doesn't mistreat women or treat them as second-class citizens. In fact, whenever a daughter is born, there is celebration because there are so few of them born in comparison to male births, and the dwarfs believe it is a blessing from their goddess Valia or Valea. Dwarf women are kept from doing certain things in dwarf society, though dwarf men are forced to do the same. Well, force is a very strong word. Dwarf society has large social pressures, but believe it or not, much of the pressure are based on their biology and predisposition. It's much like historical Viking society. Men were workmen and warriors, and women run, ran homes and led families as the men work. They don't do it because they are made to by authorities of their culture. They do it because it pleases their gods, and they are predisposed to be that way. You'll hardly ever find a dwarf female that wants to not be the master of the home and a caregiver, nor will you likely find a dwarf male that earnestly does not want to work. If you suggested they not, they wouldn't wish to, and they would also think you were infringing upon their honor. Dwarf, dwarfs value skill, wisdom, and wealth above all, though you could say that honor is above even them. Wisdom comes from age, which is why the older a dwarf is, the more respected he is. Dwarfs are also, and I'm not kidding here, biologically unable to not be perfectionists. You might think that's a good thing, and it has made them renowned for their works, but it also means they're obsessive and stubborn, and they'll take years to do something that should have been done in months and maybe even weeks. Although it does pay off often, as nearly everything they make is of superb quality. Warhammer dwarfs, as in many fantasy settings, absolutely love gold. 
Many come down with gold fever when on the journey for gold or in the presence of a large sum of it. They'll become obsessive and overly greedy, mumbling to themselves as they temporarily lose their wits. They also have hundreds of different words in their language for gold, describing value, weight, luster, texture, and so on. There is a dwarf feasting game called The Gold Song, where every dwarf at the table sings a verse in every turn. Each dwarf uses a different word for gold. They sometimes make up new words for gold so they don't lose the game, and they become a part of the language. Speaking of their language, it is called Kazalid. It's a highly secretive language, and they never speak it in front of non-dwarfs unless they are highly respected and trusted. There are a few online resources for the language, and you'll often hear dwarfs, if not speaking the language in public, using Kazalid names for various things and peoples. So they don't really converse it in public, but they will like call certain things dwarf words. For instance, if they see any green skin, meaning orcs and goblins, they'll call them grabi which is the castlet word for green skin. I realize there's been a lot of information, but hang in there. Next, we'll give a brief word on dwarf technology, which really helps us better understand dwarf society. The dwarfs are the most technologically advanced race in the Warhammer world, uh, save for the Skaven. The two are generally neck and neck, with the Skaven developing crazy inventions that might surpass dwarfs in some areas, but lose to them in others. The dwarfs gave the empire the gift of black powder weaponry, for instance, as the dwarfs have had such technology for centuries. Dwarfs also have gyrocopters, sorry, gyrocopters, which are single manned helicopters. There are also ironclad steam powered ships, massive zeppelins, and even submarines. There are dwarf units with grenade launchers, flamethrowers, and some dwarfs throw depth charges into enemy ranks. However, even if this gives them a huge edge when it comes to fighting others, particularly primitive races, it isn't as massive a boon as you might think. They are still in need of axes, armor, crossbows, and catapults. Dwarf armor can probably turn bullets, and armor can be enchanted against fire and other races have devastating spells as well. But still, dwarf technology is something to behold. The humans of the Empire have nearly as much technology, or that is to say, they have close to as much as the Dawi. Dwarfs are conservative, and though they are extremely learned in such sciences, it takes decades or maybe even centuries for the Engineers Guild to accept a new invention or experiment. It's a huge to-do and it takes much deliberation. Because of this, the men of the Empire have been able to catch up to them somewhat. However, there is still an important difference between the two. The mailings of the Empire just blatantly have less skill in making such things. The dwarfs not only taught them how, but they perfected all of it. A dwarf's rifle does not misfire like a manling's does. The humans might have seven different types of cannons, ranging from the volley gun to the great cannon to the hellblaster volley gun, etc. The dwarfs have only a few different cannon types, but all of them do not misfire, are more accurate, and just simply get the job done better. Essentially, men innovate and experiment far more frequently, but it also means their technology is far less tested and far inferior in design and quality to dwarf tech. And as I said, dwarfs still have some technology they haven't shared with the Empire as well. Also, they have a lot of domestic technology too, like clocks and pulleys and various things as well. Okay, so, I know you've all been waiting for me to talk about beer and beards. Well, wait no further, as both are integral to their culture and people. Every dwarf is like both an alcoholic connoisseur and he's ready to leap into Oktoberfest. Dwarfs consider the complexities of alcohol as important as the complexities of gold, which is saying a lot. They'll frequently shit on shoddy manling beers and they won't even touch elf wine. The dwarfs do have good reason to be like this though, because they're the greatest brewmasters in the known world. And of course, we come to the beards. A dwarf's beard is tied to their age and their wisdom. Because of such, they never trim or cut their beards. If anyone harms their beard, they would harm them physically, <laughs> and either die in the attempt at cutting their throat, or they would succeed and then take the Slayer Oath for not being able to stop the beard cutting in the first place. Let me give you an example. The largest war in the whole of the Warhammer world, which didn't have to do with chaos, has two names the War of Vengeance, and the War of the Beard, because it started when an elf king ordered a dwarf diplomat's beard cut off. The dwarf diplomat was forever shamed, 
and King Gotrek Starbreaker started the first and only world war because that elf dared to touch his envoy's beard. That is how important beards are, so be fucking careful. This brings me to how all dwarf justice and truth be told dwarf culture is formed. It is based upon what we call grudges. Believe me, it's far more serious than it sounds. Dwarfs not only hold grudges, but they record them and hold the guilty party accountable for as long as it takes. A dwarf might take decades or centuries to write a grudge, and they're not above holding your son or grandson accountable for your actions. Not only that, but grudges can, and often are, made for reasons that a human might find trivial. That's not to say that if you bump into a dwarf on the street, they'll then they'll try to kill you or your son decades later. However, if you bump into a dwarf on the street and they want you to apologize and you either don't or worse insult them, they'll hold and record a grudge and then they'll look for you. In five years, he might find you and demand recompense that amounts to an apology with an added interest of 10 gold pieces. Deny them and or make fun of them even again and they'll insist. Continue not complying and they might break your arm to coerce you drag you to their council of elders to be sentenced, or they'll come back with more demands and less patience. Now, some dwarfs might be more easygoing and not care if they are bumped in the street, but of course it depends. Every dwarf holds their honor highly, and ho however someone besmirches their honor, they'll hold them accountable. So while some dwarfs don't think that bumping into them on the street is besmirching their honor, others might, and then they'll, what seems trivial, will then turn into something huge, especially if you call it trivial. Dwarf society is cordoned off into three layers, generally. Clan, meaning ancestors, descendants, and family. Next is kingdom, as while they all serve a high king, most dwarf cities are ruled by lesser kings. And of course, guilds. Much of dwarf society is predicted, or predicated, sorry, on the guild system. And while it is possible to not be a member of a guild, you're doing yourself and your clan a disservice for not being in one. In fact, it implies you don't have the skills to be inducted into one. The only reason why a dwarf would ever not be in a guild is if he wanted to do something that is against guild rules. Uh, guilds are all associated with certain professions, by the by. Goldsmith's Guild, Brewer's Guild, Blacksmith Guild, Mason's Guild, so on. Usually people think the Engineer's Guild has the most esteem with the Miner's Guild close behind, but it depends on the region or the kingdom you're in. Speaking of kingdoms, let's talk about the various kingdoms in the setting. Now, dwarfs tend to live in what they refer to as Karaks, meaning holds, which essentially are underground fortress cities located in the mountains. They're usually quite big, even if the population of dwarfs in the modern timeline isn't nearly what it once was. Each hold is connected via what we call the Underway, which used to be a very reliable and quick way for dwarfs to travel, because it was pretty much a highway underground. But much of it now has been infested with Skaven goblins and fowler beasts, even some demons. The Underway is a huge tunnel network of underground roads the dwarfs carve in, carved in the Elder Days. Now, many dwarfs live underground and hardly ever go above ground. And in truth, many who choose to be above ground are considered kind of strange. However, a quarter or perhaps even a third of a Karak's workforce is above ground daily. Being above ground is the only way to trade with the Empire of Man, for instance. The roads are also guarded by dwarf patrols. Dwarf rangers prowl the, fo prowl the foothills of their mountain homes, and much of the dwarfs above ground are farmers of livestock and hardy crops. Though, yes, dwarfs do have underground food sources as well. Now, let's start naming the Karaks that are in the World's Edge Mountains. And I can't, I'm not going to name all of them, but I'm going to name most. There is Karaza Karak, which is the capital where High King Thorgrim Grudgebearer reigns. He is a very old dwarf, and he has vowed to avenge all grudges, which means he'll probably live for an extremely long time if he's not killed. Karak Kadrin, known as the Slayer Keep, even its ruler, King Ungrim Ironfist, is a slayer. This is where the Great Shrine of Grimnir resides. Zufbar, where many metals, particularly the fabled Gromril, is smelted. Uh, Gromril is pretty much like the dwarf version of Mithril. In fact, Warhammer Mithril is a is made is one of the alloys you can make from Gromril. Uh, its king is Morgrim Ironforge. Carrick Norn, a minor hold in the Grey Mountains between Bretonia and the Empire. Their king is Brock Ironpick. Carrick Hearn, nestled in between Tilia and Weissenland, 
called the horn hold because the mountain it's on shoots into the sky like a horn and it's one of the few holds that isn't connected to the underway its king is Alric Reinolfsson Carrick Azor, what the humans call Copper Mountain, is set just north of the Border Princes. Its king is Kazran Grimbrow. Berekvar, which is one of the few dwarf holes that is connected to the sea. Dwarfs usually don't like the sea, but they also realize its potential, its potential for trade. And the cavern system doubles as a docks. Its king is Birnoth Grundadrak. Karak Ziflin, a small hold of only 10,000 dwarfs that lies between Bretonia and the Empire. Its king is Rorik Granite Hand. Karak Asgaraz, also between Bretonia and the Empire, known for being constantly under attack, but is luckily ruled by a bold king, Thuringar Orkur. Karak Angazar, a small hold, which is even smaller than the uh, Karak Ziflin, is a small hold, uh, Karak Angazar, sorry, is a small hold that guards the ever-important Blackfire Pass. Its king is Duragar Sharpblade. Karak Azul, which holds the distinction of being the only hold still held by the dwarfs in the southern mountains, uh, right by the Badlands, where all the Greenskids live. Nicknamed the Iron Peak, it is ruled by King Kazador Thunderhorn, who is known to be a large and incredibly strong, even by dwarf standards, king. He's one of the main reasons his hold is still standing in the midst of the Badlands that teams with Greenskins. Karak Guntak is another smaller kingdom close to Angazar. Its king is Skag Hammerfist. Last but not least, Belagar Ironhammer and 3,000 dwarfs are in a constant siege in a three-way war between the dwarfs, Skaven, and Greenskins at the lost hold of Karak Eight Peaks, which is essentially the greatest hold ever which was located within eight mountains, but it was lost to the dwarfs. It's probably second only to Karaza Karak, which is still the capital. I realize many of these names don't mean much to the beginner. However, it does show just what state the dwarfs are in, as this number of holds are less than half of what the dwarfs used to control. Most have now fallen to various horrors. Now, to better understand their past and why they are who they are, I'll give a brief history lesson on the Empire and their people. I already have a literal video series and hours of video detailing dwarf history, so if you're interested in more, just go look further into my channel. But for now, I'll give some bullet points. When the Old Ones fled the world and chaos flooded the planet, the lizard men fought against the demon tides, and they were aided by the elves and the dwarfs. The dwarfs' leaders were their ancestor gods who helped them survive and taught them their culture and values. A group of dwarfs were caught in the open when the chaos tides of magic swept over the world, whereas the rest of the dwarf kind uh, managed to find refuge in the mountains. These dwarfs were mutated over time, and they also had not received the blessings of the am ancestor gods. And they turned to the only god who would save them, a bull god, a greater demon named Hashut, who eased their suffering and promised to protect them if they but worship him. These dwarfs, who grew hoofs upon their feet and became slavers and sorcerers, became the Chaos Dwarfs. But their tale is of another day. Once Chaos itself was pushed back by the combined might of Lizardmen, Dwarfs, and Elves, and the vortex created by the High Elves helped drain the Chaos magic, the Lizardmen retreated to Lustria and l left the majority of the world to the Dwarfs and the Elves. There was peace for a time, before the War of Vengeance, or the War of the Beard, broke out. The primitive men still remember it as the War of the Ancients. It was a massive conflict, and it made a. I made a 30 minute video on it if you want to see it. It's one of the best received videos that I've made, so I recommend it. Anyway, about 500 years later, the dwarfs managed to kick the elves out of the mainland and back to their island nation, and the dwarfs found themselves the masters of the old world. However, Earthquakes caused by both Nagash, the God King, and the Lizard Men moving mountains caused much of the Dwarf Kingdoms to not only be rent asunder, but it left much of their holds open to attack. And now that the Dwarfs were diminished and many of their warriors had died from the Great War against the Elves, Orcs, Goblins, Skaven, and all number of creatures filled the vacuum and attacked. And so the Dwarfs, weary from their wars with Chaos and the Elves, and attempting to live through the Earthquakes and the Volcanoes, could only pick up their axes and fight the new war, and the next 1500 years were named the Time of Woes, as over half of their empire collapsed. I made a series on that too, if you want to check it out. Anyway, Sigmar, the god of the empire, saved a dwarf king, Kurgan Ironbeard, from a group of orcs. This led the dwarfs to consider humans and put them on their radar. 
And the dwarfs then and there made an unending oath of alliance with the men of the Empire, and together, the two races slew the orcs and Skaven, particularly a uh, massive orc horde in Blackfire Pass. Though the dwarf kingdoms never regained their former glory, they still fought enemies daily. They regained some of their power in what they ca call the Age of Silver, which lasted up until the current day. So it's not their golden age, it's the Age of Silver. So it's second best, but hey, it's getting there. Okay, we're on the last two sections. The Dwarf's Religion and the Dwarf Geopolitics. The Dwarf Pantheon of Gods are called the Ancestor Gods by the Dwarfs. They believe, and might I add they are correct in this belief, that the Ancestor Gods once walked among them as one of their own. This is one reason why the Dwarfs can appreciate the Empire of Man, as their deity Sigmar was once a powerful man, just as their gods were once larger-than-life dwarfs. They also extend their religion to their more mundane ancestors as well. That's not to say that they consider their grandparents deities, but they revere them much like one might revere a saint or a famous historical figure. But let's get to the gods themselves. There are a number of them, but you really only need to know about the main three. I'll read as follows from the companion book Grudge Lore. The first god is Grungni the most important of the ancestor gods, and husband of Valya. He is the god of mining and smiths, and his greatest shrine resides at the hold of Karak Azul, known for its abundant iron reserves, its forges and armories. According to ancient scripts I have translated, meaning the Empire Man who wrote this, with varying success, I might add, it was Grungni who first taught the dwarfs how to dig minerals from the rock and to shape metal. It was also Grungni who first instructed the dwarfs in the inscribing of magical runes and gave them the tools and the means to defend themselves against their enemies. Chief among the credos of Grungni are Oath and Honor, the bulwark and the rock upon which dwarf society is founded. In many representations, Grungni is depicted in full chainmail armor with a forked beard and wielding a miner's pick, one of his chief symbols. He has a martial aspect too, and in this case he carries Drangrundrum, translated as Thunder Hammer, an ancient and powerful rune hammer. <clears throat> the next is Valya, or Valeia, I've heard both ways. The goddess of healing and protection and the wife of Grungni. She is the only dwarf goddess, but is rumored, from some conversations I've had, to be the founder of Karaza Karak, and her name is often invoked as a ward against evil sorcery. Indeed, her rune is inscribed upon banners and armor and repeatedly acts as proof against harmful magic. Valya's gift to the dwarfs was the rune of hearth and hold, echoing the cornerstones of her power within dwarf society. Depictions of Valya are often simple in nature. She is a dwarf woman with long braided hair and wears chainmail over purple robes, robes, echoed in the attire of her priestesses, with whom I have had the honor of speaking, and bears the rune axe Kradsconti, translated as peace giver. And then next there is Grimnir, the warrior god of the dwarfs, also known as Grimnir the Fearless and the brother of Grungni. While the other ancestor gods of the dwarfs are believed to be waiting in the afterlife, Grimnir is not present, having vanished long ago when legend purports he ventured northwards to close the gate of chaos through which the servants of the ruinous powers were spilling forth and infecting the land. In this task, he was gifted two rune axes, crafted by Grungni himself, and rumors persist that said artifacts have been rediscovered. But of the fate of Grimnir, nothing is written, or at least known to this scholar. Grimnir is the very embodiment of courage, fearlessness, and the warrior spirit of the dwarfs. He is the patron god of slayers, and the great shrine at Karakadrin, the Slayer Keep, is dedicated to his honor. Wrath and Ruin are the tenets of Grimnir, somewhat fatalistic in nature, but also possessed of a grim and unyielding defiance. He is depicted bare-chested and heavily muscled, much like the slayers who venerate him, covered in ritual scars, which legend legends hold, at least the ones I am privy to, were inscribed by Grimnir himself with the claw of the mighty dragon Glamendrung, with a spike of orange hair jutting from an otherwise glabrous skull scalp. He bears the rune axe, as Drugadum, translated as War Axe of Doom, his other blade rumored to have been given to his son Morgrim. Now I'll talk a little bit about the lesser gods. There are a number of other lesser dwarf gods, and their worship is restricted to certain clans and holds. Gazul, the younger brother of Grungni and Grimnir, is the lord of the Underearth and the protector of the dwarf dead. Smednir is the shaper of ore and forged many of the rune weapons of the dwarfs under the tutelage of his father, Grungni. Thungni 
is the ancestor god of runesmiths and is young and the younger brother of Smednir, while Morgrim is the ancestor god of engineers and he is the son of Grimnir. It was Morgrim that first taught the dwarfs how to construct war engines and who accompanied Grimnir into the lands of the north, but was bidden by his father to return, taking one of his axes with him. And finally, we get to geopolitics. Before we begin, let me tell you about a, an abstract chart I have created. <laughs> I call it the Dwarf Hatometer. It goes from 0 to one, zero to 10. 0 being that they don't have any feelings of animosity toward this faction, and a 10 being that they wish to exterminate every member of this race. Now, anything that is a 3 or below, a very kind-hearted and easygoing dwarf might be able to look past their differences with them. Anything that is a 4 or 5, they might, under great duress or in the face of a more hated enemy, will work with. Anything above a 6 is someone they will never work with. But yes, you guessed it. The dwarfs have a small bit of hatred for everyone, because they record all grudges in the Great Book of Grudges that their High King keeps with him at all times. By the way, the book is ruined and holds an infinite amount of pages, so it's not going to be filled up anytime soon. Anyway, let's begin. The Empire of Man and Bretonia are at a 2 on the Hatometer. The dwarfs are racist towards the manlings, but not generally in a dangerous fashion. They know they have been around longer than the menfolk, and they also see them struggling with things that are very easy to the dwarfs. That and some men have a tendency to turn to chaos, which no dwarf would ever do. In fact, even the chaos dwarfs don't worship chaos. They worship a heathen god and were warped by chaos, but even they don't join chaos armies. Humans do it plenty. The manlings backstab, betray, have shoddy gold coins, and sometimes practice weird elfy magic, and their beer sucks. However, the dwarfs appreciate the Empire of Man for their willingness to try and do well, and as stated, they have an old oath of alliance that the dwarfs will never break. Meanwhile, the dwarfs respect the men of Bretonia, as their knightly class and ideas of honor and chivalry are very dwarfy, at least in the stout folks' minds. Next, we're arriving to the southern human nations of Tilea, Estalia, Araby, etc. The dwarfs have them at a three. Dwarfs will work with them, but have no real strong attachment to them. At best, they're lucrative, lucrative trading partners, and at worst, they're liable to have grudges against them. The last human kingdom we're speaking of is Kislev, and though I have them at a two on the Hatometer, some might argue it's a one. The dwarfs might like the Kislevite people the best out of everyone who is a non-dwarf, mostly for their steadfast war against chaos, their love of strong drinks, and their general attitude. Of course, the dwarfs find them weird in certain ways, but I recall a tale once when the Skaven attacked a Kislevite noble's house, when the Kislevites and a small group of dwarfs were outnumbered ten to one, and when asked if they would retreat, the Kislevite noble said he would never give up his home to thrice poxed rat men. The wizard present, named Maximilian Schreiber, was heard to famously quote, no wonder you and the dwarfs get along. You're all as stubborn as hell. Now we move on to the northwest to Norska. Norskins are generally at a 9 or a 10. The Norse dwarfs have fought the Norskin chaos worshippers for centuries in the north, and so have the other dwarfs of the World's Edge Mountains. The dwarfs hate chaos, and though the Norskins can claim to have some of their culture influenced by the dwarfs of old, they are still fucking chaos worshippers. And I'll just, you know, reiterate again, they hate chaos in general, so it's so chaos to them is like a 10 or 11 on the meter, because chaos is literally corrupted magic and demons and the dwarfs have fought them since time began, so. Now we'll get into the three races I am putting together, the Skaven, the Greenskins, and the Vampires. I'm putting them together because on the dwarfs hato meter from 0 to 10, they have the distinction of being strong 12s. <laughs> Meaning that the dwarfs don't just want to exterminate every single one of them, but they want to pour milk down their underpants, shit in their toilet and not flush, they want to get their preferred drink of rum and coke with no ice and put fucking ice in it. They absolutely hate all of them with a passion. There are thousands of pages in the Book of Grudges against each race individually, before you even start to get to the serious stuff that they hate them for. To explain, the dwarfs are in a constant, literally daily war with Skaven and Greenskins. This war has not stopped for, and I am not exaggerating, 4,000 years. Meanwhile, the vampires are seen as little better than Chaos Spawn. 
and the dwarfs aren't entirely wrong with their assessment. However, what makes them maybe even more hated than Chaos is the reason why the dwarfs never want to attack vampires militarily. Now that's not to say that dwarfs are afraid of vampires. In fact, a dwarf is likely the best mortal to fight a vampire with their strength, endurance, magic weaponry, and their immunity to the vampire's curse and enthralling gaze. However, the vampires can do something almost no one else can, and that is raise the dwarf dead. The vampires have captured a few dwarf holds, and the only reason the dwarfs didn't invade with fire and axes was because the vampires can literally desecrate their ancestors, and destroy their ancestors' afterlife, because dwarf burials are very culturally important. But yeah, if there was a button the dwarfs could press to kill all vampires, Skaven and Greenskins, they wouldn't press it just so they could have the satisfaction of doing it the old-fashioned way and they do it slowly. Even if you're an upbeat dwarf, you're gonna hate them. That's just, that's pretty much like, why would you not? Like, what, what the fuck would be wrong with you? You would literally be, you would be shunned from dwarf society if you even gave any kind of, oh, you know, they're not so bad to any of those races. Believe me. Now. Let's move on to a race that you're all wondering about. The Elves. Needless to say, the Dwarfs and the Elves have a long history of mutual dislike and conflict. There are many pages set aside in the Book of Grudges just for the Elf race, and the Dwarfs don't differentiate too much on Elven sub-races. An Elf is an Elf to them. The Dwarfs do understand that Elves are not as monstrous as Greenskins or Demons, and they do acknowledge that the Elf has done the decent thing once or twice. And when, like when the last great chaos incursion occurred and the dwarves, elves, and men of the empire went to Kislev to halt the invasion from the north. There they fought side by side as much as they hated doing it. But their ancestral memory, their huge differences in outlook and culture, and their many grudges keep them from ever being friendly again. The elves are at a 5 on the hatometer, at the very largest amount of hate the dwarves have, while they might, just might, still fight with them if there is a greater foe. I'll read two dwarf sayings now that shows just what they think of elves. <clears throat> Revere the ancestors, obey your king, bear your arms with pride, fear no foe, hate the green skin, mistrust the elf, and you can do no wrong. And the next dwarf saying is, there is nothing as sure in this world as the glitter of gold and the treachery of elves. So yeah, they really don't like him. So let's get into lesser known territory with the next few races. Let's talk on the ogres next. The ogres are around a 4 or 5 on the hatometer. The dwarfs don't hate them, hate them necessarily, but they don't trust them at all, and for good reason. An ogre either robs you blind with bad taxes when you go through the mountains of Morn, or the ogres hire themselves out as mercenaries and betray you at their convenience. I recall a dwarf king, I think it was Ungram Ironfist, that hired a famous ogre named Golgfag Maneater who joined the dwarfs. Then he joined the Greenskins, then the Dwarfs, then the Greenskins, so on and so forth because both sides kept paying him to betray the other. And the Dwarfs hate people that go back on their promises and oaths. Like, they really hate them. So the Dwarfs don't hire Ogres anymore, really. But some entrepreneurial Dwarfs aren't above hiring them every now and then if they weren't a part of a hold that got betrayed. And, you know, if a Dwarf mercenary is traveling and abandoned Ogres in it, he's not gonna kill the Ogre immediately or, you know, or fight him, but, like... It really depends on where you're from as a dwarf, but like usually they won't really like him too much. Up next is the Tomb Kings, and on the Hatometer, they are at a 6 or 7. They don't really mess with each other, other than maybe a dwarf adventurer coming in to plunder some gold or try to find a lost Karak in the middle of Nehekaran lands. Honestly, the main beef dwarfs have with Tomb Kings is that they are undead, and that's a fucking terrible thing to be. So we'll need to kill you permanently, essentially. But they don't hate them as much as vampires, because vampires scheme and try to take over dwarf places sometimes. Tomb Kings usually don't. Now we'll go with a simple one. The Chaos Dwarfs. They are at a 10 on the Hatometer. The only reason why they aren't higher is because they don't usually interact with the regular dwarfs much. And even if they fight with one another, the Chaos Dwarfs usually use slaves to fight mostly. But yes, the dwarfs hate them. They hate them other than the fact that, you know, they'd be enemies anyway, they hate them for their magic, their way of life, but they mostly hate them for being so goddamn non-dwarfy. They hate them because they didn't grit their teeth and man up through the first invasion of chaos, or did the honorable thing and killed themselves when they were mutated. They just turned to a demon god which no dwarf should ever, ever do. 
but they did, so they're hated. Now, last but not least is a strange one, the Lizard Men, and I'll go into detail with this one. I am not certain of their rating on the Hatometer because they are seriously, they really don't ever interact, even in the past. The Lizard Men live in Lustria in the Southlands, being the equivalent to South America and South Africa in our world, or Africa, but they live in the southern portion. And no dwarfs live there. They used to, at least in the Southlands, but they don't anymore. And neither races really travel to each other's areas, really. The two races are also very similar, which is why they're both my favorite Warhammer races. They're both high, highly religious and traditionalist, both very tough, but most importantly, and this is my favorite part, you never get between either race and their goal. If you get between a dwarf and a grudge, or between a lizard man and something they deem important to their religion, you will die. They will go right through you. And they both staunchly hate Chaos and Skaven. Honestly, since they probably just don't know each other, I'll put the Hatometer at a 3. The dwarfs would likely just think of them as local monsters. And that's it. that isn't to say they've never ever met, though. Just, there's been no diplomatic relations for good or bad, and there's never been, like, dwarf armies that have met lizardmen armies. Uh, there's just, I mean, it, whenever they've met, there's only been just, like, dwarf adventurers going through the jungle, or lizardmen going up north for some reason. They just bump into each other and it's like, hey, you, you're different. And then they'll probably fight because, you know, they're really different. <laughs> now, I will say, though, that while the two are very alike, they both have a large potential for hating one another, and there are two very good reasons for this. The lizard men might hate the dwarfs because the dwarfs are obsessed with gold, and often will take gold from those who they deem as mere beasts. And though the lizard men don't value gold, they do place many of their religious tablets and decrees on a lot of their gold. And if you steal one of those, oh boy, that, that's bad. On the flip side, it was in part the fault of the lizard men that the dwarf's time of woes began, because I stated earlier, the Slan mage priests of the Lizardmen decided to move a few mountains in the World's Edge Mountains because they believed that was a part of the Old, Man, old One's plan. And once they did that, earthquakes and volcanic activity fucked up the dwarf Carax, and it also opened fissures in the ground where Skaven goblins and bigger, more terrible monstrosities streamed forth. Now, the dwarfs don't know the Slan did this, but if they were to ever find out, the hater meter would go from a 3 to an 11, let's just say, and there'd be a whole lot of grudges. So that's something that you can either use in a campaign, or something that'd be neat to write about at some point. But yeah, they don't hate each other, really, but they really fucking might. Okay, wow. That was a long video. I hope you enjoyed it, though. Again, if you'd like to support me, you can support me on my Patreon. Um, thank you so much for listening, and I hope to see you all again soon. Have a good day.